Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be to our archives for you to watch at your convenience. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in the state. Um, we're like your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, um, anything. So uh, we will have topics on the show for all types of libraries. Um, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, anything they think they may be interested, libraries uh, across the board may be interested in. Uh, sometimes we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do sessions uh, specific to services and programs we're offering here in Nebraska, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that is what we have this morning. Uh, joining us today is Matt Amory. Amory, did I pronounce that right? Amory? I didn't yes, know you that. Did. Ah, okay. And he is um, joining us from the East Coast, Kent, Massachusetts Public Library, but he's going to talk to us about something very important to many public librarians or anyone in public service, um, the uh, Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which has had some struggles over the years, <laughs> but seems to have gotten its got back on its feet and seems to be working yeah we'll learn all about that so um i'll just hand it over to you matt take it away and tell us all about it okay thanks uh as uh, thank you krista um and thank you uh and connect thank you uh thank you nebraska hello nebraska <laughs> um my name is matt amory and i am a technology librarian in the canton public library in canton massachusetts um i am also a public service loan forgiveness uh recipient so there are there there aren't that many of us around, uh, but I can tell you that this program uh, worked for me as a public servant, as a town employee. Uh, it worked for me, and I made 120 payments, and my uh, remaining balance on my student loans was discharged, was forgiven, with no tax consequences. So, um, congratulations. Service, I beg your pardon. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and so what I have, what I have, I learned about this. So forget, uh, let me just talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. So uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to briefly talk about what the public service loan forgiveness requirements have been, what they were in the past and what they will be once again. And then we're going to talk about this incredible temporary waiver of rules which allows right now between now and october 31st of 2022 for huge amounts of huge amount huge numbers of payments which had previously been disqualified to become qualified and increase your count of uh qualifying payments and move you further along the line towards that 120 payments so that's what we're going to do today and i'm going to show you a powerpoint document that actually walks you through exactly the steps that you need to take to get on track so i'm going to advance my screen here and uh first off i'm going to say um under normal circumstances i have a i have a presentation that starts with um student loan debt and talks about how bad student loan debt and how um, unfairly student loan debt uh intersectionally uh, affects women and minorities and all of that. But because you're here for public service loan forgiveness, I think you probably know all of that stuff. Um, everyone who has student loans and who works in public service can benefit from this program. So that said, here are the original requirements for qualifying payments for the for uh, to, for, for public service loan forgiveness. So to start with, the whole idea of public service loan forgiveness is that you accumulate 
qualifying payments. So each month that you make a payment, depending on these criteria, depending on whether you meet the criteria or not, your payment will qualify or not qualify. You don't have to do 120 in a row, uh, which is great. So like if you work for a couple of years and then take some time off, you can come back at, when you come back to work again, you can pick up right where you right where you were. So payments do not need to be sequential. Um, but the idea is to accumulate 120 qualifying payments. Now, in the past, prior to October of this past year, uh, and after November of this coming year, these are going to be the qualifications that payments need to meet in order to qualify and in order to add to your account. So, um, while you are making a payment, you need to be employed full time in public service. You need to have had direct loans in repayment, and you need to have paid on time and in full, and you need to have been enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan. So that's an awful lot of mouthful, and that's pretty that's kind of complicated. And all of those definitions are available on studentaid.gov, the, the the federal student aid website. But a lot of that stuff is really confusing, and even though it's been simplified and it's been and it's been explained better now than it ever has been before. Um, there were a lot of people who started making pay who started making qualified payments as far back as 20 as far back as 2007 who have never had any information about how this program actually works. So those people have, for the benefit of those people who have been shut out of making qualifying payments because they had never been informed. The administration put in this grand sweeping temporary waiver, um, which relaxes the qualification, which relaxes the necessary qualifications for qualifying payments. So during this period of time between last October and between this coming uh, and up until this coming October 31st, a lot of the rules which had arbitrarily disqualified payments in the past have been waived. Um, specifically, this means any payments that were made prior to a loan consolidation. So um, loan consolidation is where you bring together uh, loans and you repay the you repay the entire balance as one single loan. Um, oftentimes, to <laughs> and the worst thing about this was that there were, there are there are loans that are ineligible for public service loan forgiveness. The only solution to that was to consolidate the loans. But when you consolidated the loans in the past you started all over at zero on a new loan. So under this waiver, if you make, if you consolidate your loans, you get credit for payments that you made before the consolidation. And if you have consolidated your loans in the past, you will get credit for payments that you made on those loans prior to their consolidation. So that's a huge, huge, huge change in the way payments are qualified. And please note, that this will go away on October 31st of 2022. This was this waiver is funded by COVID uh, recovery money, so the authorization is limited. So going back to the rules, which has arbitrarily disqualified payments, which have been waived. Um, so payments made while enrolled in a non-qualifying repayment plan. Um, again, many people made a lot of payments without realizing that they were in a payment a repayment plan that did not qualify right. for public service loan forgiveness. So a lot of those people, when they go to try and apply for their public service loan forgiveness, when they think they've made 120 payments, they discover much to their chagrin that they have actually made only six qualifying payments. And so the last category of uh, payments which will not, which will qualify under the temporary waiver but had not qualified in the past are payments that had not been made on time or had not been made in full. So what this means is that lots, if you have lots of payments that have, not, that have been disqualified in the past, you will get credit, qualifying payment credit for those payments in the near future by spring without any action necessary on your part. The, the, the Department of Education is going through their payment records and they are reclassifying disqualifying disqualified payments as qualifying payments. And you will see a big if you if you have made disqualified if you've made 
payments in the past that have not qualified, you will see a, a jump, a bump in your payments, a jump in your payments, probably possibly a huge jump in your payments. Wow. That is possible. something we had a question about. Somebody wanted to know already, how do we know that this is a thing, that this is happening? But you said they're proactively doing that part. They are proactively going through every single student loan account. And even the, so, there's a, so <laughs> yes, the Department of Education is going through all of their payment records and will change the change the status of payments that have been received in the past and they will send information about those now now qualifying payments to your loan servicer more on loan servicers later mm -hmm. but uh, under these new rules it is now possible um, to consolidate ineligible loans without disaster so as i mentioned before in the past if you were to consolidate your loans it would restart your payment count at zero um, so let's move on. And so what this means, so this is limited and temporary. So some of the rules have been relaxed, some have not, which makes the path to PSLF easier to negotiate and changes the disaster and removes the disastrous consequences of making a mistake, doing some, doing things in the wrong order. But you must consolidate your ineligible loans before October 31st of 22 because as I mentioned earlier, this waiver is temporary. It's funded by um, COVID dollars. This information is all available at this URL down here. Um, and you can find this URL by searching PSLF waiver and going to the studentaid.gov link that you find. So under this new waiver, there are now three categories of borrower. And those three bar those three categories of borrower have three different paths to PSLF under the waiver. So the first category, um, if you are a borrower who has any federal family education loan program loans or Perkins loans, so federal family education loan program was the the old program that they where the government backstop the Department of Education guaranteed student loans that were issued and owned by private banks um so basically <laughs> a pretty ugly a pretty ugly system um but those loans are consolidatable um those loans can be consolidated into direct loans perkins loans which are typically owned by the um the the higher education institution which you are attending those loans are also federal loans and they can be consolidated so First category, if you are a borrower who has any FELL loans or any Perkins loans, you must consolidate those loans into direct loans. Second category, direct loan borrowers who have never certified their income uh, must certify their income. So if you, so there are two pieces of, um, there are two pieces of this, of this process. There's the, there's making a payment to your loan servicer, and then there's certifying your employment which allows for the payment information to be uh cross-referenced with your employment ref your employment information so when the two when both of those things are available when you have a payment and when you have a when you have qualified employment that together makes a qualifying payment and adds to your count so direct people who have all direct loans uh, must, but have never certified their income, must certify their income. And the third category, borrowers who have already certified their income and are on track, those people need to keep on certifying their income periodically um, in order to continue to gain qualifying credits. This information, again, um, and all the information in this, in all the information, all the subsequent information in this, uh, in here is is at this URL, this specific URL, loan types, next steps, um, but this is all available within the uh, PLS limited waiver uh, page, and you can find that on Google if you just type limited waiver PSLF and you go to the student aid site. As you probably know, if you've done any Googling about student loans, the first thing that's going to come up in any search is going to be uh, a private lender looking to um, give you a slightly lower 
interest rate but when but if you have refinanced with a private lender like that you when you re, when you refinance with a private lender you become completely ineligible for public service loan forgiveness because your loan is no longer owned by the Department of Education it becomes the prop it becomes owned by SoFi or Ernest or some bank or some some other some other private institution and it's not it's because it's no longer owned by the Department of Education the Department of Education can't do anything about forgiving it so these are the three categories so those cat so the same way that the five the same way that all of those requirements for qualifying payments are confusing even these three um, categories can be confusing especially if you're especially if you haven't if you're new to the public service loan forgiveness program and you and you don't really and you and you don't have a and you don't really have any if you don't, if you just if you've just been paying your loan payments as you as they come in if you don't really have a lot of familiarity with, with what your loan types are I'm going to show you I'm going to show I'm going to I'm going to have the next the next slides are all about asking questions and getting you started so um, we're going to talk about what that means and we're going to talk about where we fit in so the first question that we need to ask here, answer question one. This question is, do you have federal student loans in repayment and have you worked full time in public service? So if you are here um, and you're a librarian, you work in public service. The definition of public service um, for public service loan forgiveness purposes is, do you work for a government employer? If you do, you're automatically uh, working in public service. Uh, municipal, local, county, uh, state, tribal, or federal government uh, qualifies 100%. Do, if you work for a 501c3 nonprofit, 100% of 501c3 uh, employers are qualifying employers. So if you work for the government, if you work for a 501c3 nonprofit, you definitely qualify. If you work for a different kind of nonprofit that's not a 501c3, um, but does work does ha, does have public service work does do public service work you also qualify but there's a, there's a, that's a that's a very small slice of people in the broad world of people who are eligible for public service loan forgiveness so here uh so do you do you have federal student loans in repayment have you worked in public service um these links go to different places in here but i'm going to just go on to the second question so the second question is do you know what types of loans you have there's more than one kind of loan. So oftentimes people will say, I have a Navient loan and I have an Ed Financial loan and I have a Great Lakes loan. So those are three different servicers, but those loan servicers do not own the loans and describing your loans in that way is not the type of loan that they are. When in order to find out the type of loan that you have, you need to visit the you need to visit studentaid.gov and look at your aid summary, and that will tell you exactly what type of loan you have. And the types of loans that we're interested in are direct loans, we're interested in FEL loans, and we're interested in Perkins loans. So the direct loans qualify already to for for public service loan forgiveness, the FEL loans and the Perkins loans, once again, need to be consolidated into direct loans in order for them to become eligible. So let's move on to the third question here. Do you know or did your aid summary show that you have FEL or Perkins loans? These loans are not eligible for PSLF, so I sort of talked about that earlier. Question number four, have you ever certified your employment by submitting an employment certification form? That was the old name for it, or a PSLF application form. That's the new name for the combined form, which is the application for final forgiveness for under PSLF, also under TEPSLF, Temporary Expanded Public Service Loan Forgiveness, but we're not going to cover that right now. It's different from the temporary waiver. Um, if you know what TEPSLF -E is, you're ahead of the game, and you're <laughs> and the rest of these questions are probably going to be simple for you. So the fifth question is, did the Department of Education say they would add qualifying payments for you? So a lot of people who are borrowers received an email from the Department of Education that says, looking back at your payment records, which is the process that they're in right now, looking back at your payment records, we estimate that you have 50 extra payments which are currently disqualified but will qualify real soon real soon <laughs> in the spring um, and then the last question is 
does this make more sense now? So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to walk through these questions. And so I'm going to say, do you have federal loans? I'm going to I'm going to answer these questions. This is like a choose your own adventure <laughs> uh, PowerPoint now. Um, do you have federal student loans in repayment? Have you worked full time in public service? And I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to click over here to go to question two. Question two says, do you know what type of loans you have? There's more than one type of loan. And I'm going to say, yes, I do. I know that I have all. I know that I have direct loans. Um, did did you do you know or did your aid summary show that you have Fell or Perkins loans? These loans are not eligible. I have I only have direct loans. I'm going to say no. Have you ever certified your employment by submitting an employment certification form? And I'm going to say no. No, I don't. No, I don't. I'm going to go to action three. So action three. This is employment certification basics. Um, let me actually go back. Let me go. Let me actually go back here. And I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to the first question. So again, um, if you're starting at the very beginning, the first thing that you need to do is determine the types of loans that you have because the types of loans that you have again that's direct loans, Fell loans, Perkins loans. The type of loan that you have will determine what you need to do. So again, click on the aid summary at studentaid.gov. In order to get into studentaid.gov, you'll need to have a FSA ID, a federal student aid ID. If you've recently applied for a, a FA, if you've recently put in a FAFSA, um, if you've been if you've been on studentaid.gov, uh, you have one of those already. But if you don't, if you've never been to studentaid.gov or if it's been a long, long time since you got your loans, you may have to go to studentaid.gov and establish a login. That usually takes 48, 72 hours. Um, but once you have that ID, you can get into studentaid.gov and you can get into your very own personal aid summary page. And that page will display the loan type for every individual loan that you have. Again, the three different types that we're concerned about are direct, fell, and Perkins. So, so no matter, so even if you have things that are not those, like all of your loans are going to be at that one location every single one of your loans will have either the word direct in the title the word fell in the title or the word perkins in the title if you have other loans that are private loans um, or if you have uh taken out a home equity line of credit on your house in order to in order to pay off your loan in order to pay things off if you've borrowed money from your your uncle in order to pay off your loans those 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 that's not going to be free that's not going to be forgiven through public right. service loans. Right. so but any federal loan owned by the department of education will appear in your aid summary and in that and in that line you in that title of that loan you'll either see the word direct the word fell or the word perkins so having having that knowledge about your loans what we're going to do is move on here this is go to question three <laughs> but what i'm going to actually do is go back here and go to determine your loan types now what we're going to so if so if you do have any loans which are fell or perkins loans those loans have those loans are not eligible for pslf um, no matter whether you've been paying on them since 2007, no matter whether you've been paying on them since 2011, no matter whether you've been paying on them since 2017, they are not eligible for public service loan forgiveness because only direct loans are eligible. So if you do have Bell loans or Perkins loans, you need to go through the process of direct loan consolidation in order to convert, consolidate those loans together into direct loans. So um, right now, between now and October 31st of 2022, you can consolidate loans and you can preserve the payments that you made prior to consolidation, as we, as we talked about before. Um, but after 10, after 10 31, 2022, the rules are going to revert to the previous complicated rules and the previous consol the previous um, harsh consolidation rules. And so, if you have these loans and you need to consolidate them, get that consolidation Do done by Get on it right away. Yeah. Yes, right now. Why not now? <laughs> Please and don't so wait. You want to do this consolidation before you apply for the forgiveness because they've got to be in this type of situation. Exactly. Right. So if you apply for forgiveness. Uh, if you apply for forgiveness, if you send in, if you send in your forgiveness application, if you send in your employment certification, um, 
and you don't have all of your loans consolidated, you're you could run you could find yourself with some of your loans forgiven and some of your loans not forgiven. Now, the great thing about this temporary window, this temporary the window this window under the temporary waiver is that when you consolidate your loans, um, you get the the new consolidation loan rather than having a count of zero on it, it will have the it will have the loan count that is the highest of any of your loans, which is fantastic and actually means that people who have had loans from their undergrad eight years ago and have loans from their uh, grad school and have loans from their master's degree from three years ago and have loans from their PhD from one year ago and have parent plus loans in their for their children that they've only had for like six months, they consolidate all of those together and they pick up the the payment count from their undergrad loans so they really so this is a fantastic opportunity to consolidate your loans and come up with the highest possible count um, again after 10 31 2022 this will no longer be the case so if you do have fell loans or perkins loans to consolidate do it now please do it now please do it now don't don't come around don't 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 come around november 1st and say I really didn't. I really wasn't. I really wasn't notified about this. This is terrible. This is a bad. This is a bad program. Because <laughs> this is this uh, this temporary waiver is your opportunity. If you have been treated poorly by the public service loan forgiveness, this waiver is your chance to mm -hmm. get a, to get <laughs> to finally stop getting the short end of the stick. So the second thing about so here, plan your consolidation. Um, when you can so there's two different ways to consolidate you can consolidate entirely online or you can fill in a paper online you can fill in a paper uh consolidation application regardless of what you do when you fill out that after you after you figure out all the loans that you want to consolidate you must select fed loan servicing as your new servicer fed loan servicing is the pslf loan servicer so if you're currently with Granite State or um, Ed Financial or AES or any servicer other than FedLoan, your servicer that you're working with right now cannot calculate the number of qualifying payments that you've made. The servicer that you're with now cannot qualify your payments. FedLoan, once again, is the only servicer who will be able to calculate your payment count and will be able to forward your student loans to the Department of Education for forgiveness. So <laughs> select Fed Loan Servicing as your servicer as you consolidate. Also, um, if you are not in a qualifying repayment plan, and that's an income-driven repayment plan, the three, the four income-driven repayment plans are income-based repayment, income-contingent repayment, pay, P-A-Y-E, pay as you earn, and repay revised pay as you earn. So income-based repayment, income contingent repayment, pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn. Those four income-driven repayment plans qualify. You make qualifying repayment, you make qualifying payments under those plans and you, and they'll count towards your count. Um, again, consolidate before 1031, 2022, or you'll miss out on these, these opportunities. Um, so next, um, consolidate. Um, this is the address for the online consolidation form. Again, you're going to need an FSA ID to get to, to get into that page. Um, if you go to the FSA, if you go to the studentaid.gov website and you you can find the you can find the PDF of the paper application, and you do not need to have an FSA ID in order to get to that. So next. After you do submit your consolidation forms, which you must do dated by October 31st of 2022 in order to take advantage of this, what you'll need to do is wait. There's a lot of waiting involved in this program, especially at the beginning, especially as you're getting set up. So after you consolidate, you need to wait between 30 and 60 days for your consolidation to be finalized for Fed loan servicing to take all of your loans from all of your other servicers and consolidate them into a direct loan that they are servicing. You gotta wait 30 or 60 days for that. And you secondly, you have to wait for FedLoan to contact you. Usually they'll send you a, 
a piece of mail or they'll send you an email. Um, and in that email, there will be instructions to set up an online account at myfedloan.org. Myfedloan.org is where you are going to go to check your progress, where you're going to go to submit, sub, uh, to upload subsequent employment certification forms. Um, and the great thing is the check, the check my progress, which is available on a desktop version, but not on the uh, MyFedLoan app. Um, check my progress will show you exactly how many payments you've made and will show you exactly how many payments remain to be made. So the next, uh, okay, so we're going to, so consolidation, um, we've talked about consolidation and that's, and again, if you have Fell or Perkins loans, those loads need to be consolidated and you need to move those loans to Fed Loan Servicing. And as you're doing that, you need to sign up for a qualifying, a qualifying repayment plan. So here we get into the second category and what you need to do if your loans are already direct, but you have never yet submitted employment certification. So each month that you have made a payment has to correspond with a month that you worked in public service in order for it to qualify. So Fed Loan Servicing gets uh, will take your employment certification and it will track your number of qualifying payments. Again, no other servicer can qualify your payments and no other servicer can or will track your count of qualifying payments. Not Navient, not Advantage, not Mohila, not Great Lakes, not Nelnet, not nobody, and none of those other servicers are reliable sources of information about any facet of public service loan forgiveness because they do not administer the program. They are not the public service loan forgiveness servicer. Only Fed Loan Servicing is. So um, employment can only be certified and payments can only be qualified with a, a PSLF application form signed by your employer. So this is the old employment certification form. The new PSLF application form combines these two forms that were almost identical into one form. So in order to certify your in order to certify your employment, you need to fill in this form. You can't just send a letter that says, "Hey, I've worked, um, I've worked for the, I've worked for the county for the last 15 years." You got to fill in the form because Fed Loan responds to forms, not to, uh, not to, <laughs> not to even impassioned, <laughs> impassioned letters. So how the to certify? Right, they have to have the right paperwork. The Fed, federal the, government is very specific. They are very, they very, very, very specific. Paperwork. Yes. They don't so, understand. Yeah. They can think they're very them. specific. They're very, very <laughs> literal. Very literal. That's the word. Yes. <laughs> very literal. Yes. Yeah. If you certify, you apply for PS, you apply, you apply for public service loan forgiveness by submitting the public service loan application form. You certify your employment by submitting the public service loan forgiveness application form and temporary expanded PSLF application form and employment certification form. The easiest way to get one of these forms, the easiest way to, to print out one of these forms and get it for your employer to sign is to use this great thing called the PSLF help tool. Um, you can get to that at studentaid.gov slash PSLF. There's also a paper form available at that address, um, but the paper forms are not processed as quickly and um, if you're like me, um, sometimes when you fill out a form uh, in paper, um, you write things wrong, spell things wrong. I, I make a lot of mistakes when um, when I'm filling forms in paper. But using this PSLF help tool will automatically generate a properly formatted, information saturated. Uh, form that will be accepted by the government as long as you have um, as long as you have your proper signature. So um, here's one last thing. Um, even if you have a totally legit public service employer, um, there are some employers where when you put in the employer identification number, the PSLF the PSLF help tool may say that they are likely ineligible because the the database that they use to um, verify employers is not 100% complete. Um, if you get that likely ineligible message, don't panic. Um, just know that they are working on it, but they have a huge, huge, huge backlog. There's no timeline for when that project is going to be completed 
in toto and there's no um uh there's no timeline for when your individual employer will become eligible um, but that process is ongoing um, so once you have this form um, what you need to do is bring it to your usually usually bring it to human resources but if you're a teacher um, you can get it signed by your principal basically anyone can sign your form by signing it, they're basically saying they're basically affirming that they have re that they have access to your personnel file and that they can that they can verify your employment going for the period that you specify. So second, third piece of sitting, submitting employment certification. So the easiest way once you have once you have your form signed, the easiest way to submit it is to upload it on your myfedloan.org account. Um, you can upload a scanned image uh, directly using the upload tab at myfedloan.org. Um, if you are doing this for the first time um, and you have a different and you have a different servicer, what you'll need to do is fill out the paper form and you need to submit it by fax or by mail um, or by fax and then by fax again and then by mail as I did. <laughs> I sent the fax. I sent the I sent the fax with the the fax confirmation sheet, and then I took a copy and I put that in the mail just to be sure. You know, some people aren't as compulsive as me, but anyway. Um, so again, you cannot certify your employment with your old servicer if your servicer was Mohila or Navient or Advantage or Nelnet, anyone else besides FedLoan. The way to certify your employment is to submit the form to FedLoan. You can either do, and you can either do that on myfedloan.org by uploading it, or you can get it to FedLoan by fax or by mail. Um, and you need to certify every period of employment from every employer to get credit for every qualifying payment. So people often ask, um, do I have to go back to my employer from seven years ago to get them to sign off? And the answer is, well, you don't have to, but if you want to get a qualifying, if you want to get qualifying payments, if you want to get qualifying credit for the payments that you made while you were employed seven years ago, you do have to go back to that, um, uh, that HR department. Um, I found that sending, um, sending the form with a self-addressed stamped envelope was very effective. Um, during uh, this period of office closure, sometimes people have a little bit more difficulty with that. There are some pretty specific uh, rules for how, uh, for, for like, there's some persnickety rules about how these uh, applications can be accepted, but um, you'll, but like me, you'll find out exactly what those are when you mess up. <laughs> so, uh, last thing, after you submit your employment certification, again, you have to wait. <laughs> When you submit your employment certification, your all of your loans will automatically be taken over by FedLoan. So you're going to wait 30 to 60 days for your cons, uh, for your sorry this says consolidation. Uh, you're going to wait 36 day 30 to 60 days for your employment certification to be finalized. And you're going to wait once again if you don't have a FedLoan appointment, you're going to be you're going to wait for FedLoan to contact you about setting up an online account at myfedloan.org. Once you have your myfedloan.org uh, account, you'll be able to click on the Check My Progress button on the desktop version, and that will present exactly how many payments you've made and how many payments remain. And the next state, the next state, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Um, after you have submitted all your employment up to the present date, what you need to do is in six months, you need to submit employment for submit your employment certification for that six months. They recommend that you do this on a sort of an annual basis. Some people are more compulsive. Some people like to do it every single month. I don't know that the, I don't know that you need to be that I don't know that you need to be that compulsive about it, but maybe you do. All right. So then, uh, so rinse and repeat. Keep current with certifying your employment so you know where you stand. And again, it's not required to submit uh, annual employment certification, but that's the recommendation. So um, we've talked about checking out your loan types. We've talked about consolidating your loans if you need to, and we've talked about certifying your employment. So those are really the only things that you need to do. Um, and again, if you so again, if you have 
If you have ineligible loans, those need to be consolidated. When you consolidate those loans now under the temporary waiver, you will get credit for all of the payments that you've made on those loans in the past. When you have those loans with all of those payments in the past, you need to certify the certify all that employment for all that period of time, and then you need to continue to submit employment certification going forward. If you have all direct loans um, with different payment counts, I, you have some loans that have 80 payments, you have some loans that have 20 payments, you can also consolidate all those loans together. And like magic, your loans that you've only been paying on for a little while will pick up the highest payment count of any loan that you have ever had, which is still in repayment. Nice. So okay. consolidate, actually, consolidate, it, consolidate, certify yeah, employment, certify employment, certify somebody, employment. The, the, you mentioned that because that's really slick. Because uh, someone yeah. did ask, actually, I was going to bring this up. They said, I have 10 separate direct loans. Do I need to consolidate those? Does it make sense to do so? So the only reason, in general, the in general consolidating is good for almost everyone. The only person, the only borrower for whom consolidation will not be advantageous is the borrower who has every single loan has the exact same number of payments. So like if you... Consolidating wouldn't make a difference. Consolidating won't make a difference for that person. It's just but, a waste of time for them. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, it's just, it's, it'll just, it, it's just a way it's it, like, it, it doesn't make, it won't make any difference. Um, make, yeah, but yeah. anyone who has either any ineligible loans or any direct loans that have a smaller number of payments than other direct loans in their portfolio, consolidate, mm -hmm. and, uh, certify your employment. Rinse, and repeat. Yeah. And then it'll go back. Then for all of those, it counts from whichever had the most payments. Exactly. That's really so, awesome. <laughs> here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to, uh, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to open this up a little bit and we're now at the time where, uh, I guess we have, so I, I'm all done. That's, that's all, that's, that's everything about that. That's it. Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Um, I see you have a slide that says more resources there. Um, yes, and I do. you did mention um, more you know. resources. So this, forgive me, let's I'll go back to I'll go back to full screen here. Okay. Um, this entire presentation with these questions and these steps is an expanded mm -hmm. version of this web page studentaid.gov announcements, PSLF limited waiver loan types, next steps. Um, and on that page is where those three categories of borrowers exist. What I did with opening up the questions a little bit more was help people understand where they fit into those three, those three categories. If you do not believe that you fit into one of those categories, you are mistaken. Um, and then there's more, there's a lot more great, there's a lot more great information in general about public service loan forgiveness at this URL here. There's a lot more specific information about the limited, the temporary limited waiver at this URL here. And then there are also a lot of, you know, the, so in addition to calling FedLoan, um, the phone reps at FedLoan have way, 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 way too much call volume to be able to um, answer your phone's in a uh, in a in a reasonable time, mm -hmm. um, so met, so please so calling Fed loan calling calling Fed loan is a bad idea. Calling your servicer is an even worse idea because, like I said earlier, your servicer if it's not Fed loan, whether it's Navient, Aid Vantage, Mohila, uh, Granite State, uh, Nelnet, et, uh, Osla, any of any of these other servicers, they mm -hmm. do not have specific information about your public service loan forgiveness progress. The only information that they are going to give you is going to be um, stale, bad, nonspecific, mm -hmm. unreliable. So calling your own loan, calling your existing loan servicer is the absolute worst thing. They will give you you'll you'll come out of there with less information than you have now. Calling Fed Loan, talking to them on the phone, not not a good use of your time. 
emailing FedLoan from your myfedloan.org account might work. Sometimes you get boilerplate responses, but it's good to have a paper trail. Um, messaging FedLoan on their uh, Facebook page tends to get good responses from really from talented, qualified uh, PSLF representatives. Um, it does take it does take a little while. Um, but they do they do give individual responses. I myself received an individual response that answered my question, the question that I had talked on the phone and emailed and not gotten any not gotten any satisfactory answer. When I when I when I when I direct messaged FedLoan on Facebook, they got back to me in a couple of days and they gave me a they gave me an authoritative response which was actually what I had thought it was going to be, even though the phone reps and the emails had not been able to reassure me. So there are, so FedLoan is, uh, so FedLoan is a resource. You can contact FedLoan in a bunch of different ways. There are also some peer-to-peer -peer resources. Um, I'm going to mention Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program Support on Facebook. That's a group that I'm an admin of. We have about 90,000 members. Yeah. Um, and we're moderated and administered by, um, you know, jerky know-it-alls like me. <laughs> helpful, helpful know-it-alls. There's also a subreddit r at r dot at r slash pslf that has about twenty thousand members, and they're again moderated by, you know, jerky know-it-alls like myself. But they also have one of their administrators is a fantastic, uh, bona fide professional student loan counselor and she is on the inside of this public so public service loan forgiveness process she is very 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 uh learned and uh and talented at dealing with this mm -hmm. um both of these groups have experienced huge 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 growth since uh october Sure. When the when the wa when the waiver was announced, since uh, mm -hmm. since last March, when the uh, when the COVID loan forgiven when the COVID forbearance was put into place, since and every time when every time when the loan every time when that forbearance has been expand has been extended, we've received huge numbers of new members. That so that that brings up another question. So if you are if you do have direct loans and you are in if you have direct loans, you are currently up till April, up till the up till the end of April of this year. You have been, uh, you basically have had a your payment has been reset to zero and your interest rate has been reset to zero. So if you are paying zero because your uh, because your servicer is not is not asking you to pay anything, and if you're paying if you're paying a zero percent interest rate, then you know that you have direct loans. If you are still receiving bills from your servicer, if you're still being charged interest, then you know that the loans that you have are not direct loans and that there is something that you need to do, that you need to consolidate those loans into direct loans. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer resources, that's it. There's nothing left. Uh, um, and we actually have a comment. Um, I have a couple of questions that did come in. Anybody does have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, but I'll just jump down to the one. Um, Laura, who's actually a librarian here in Nebraska, who's been a presenter on our show before, said the, the PSLF Facebook group is so helpful. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That we're doing this presentation too to get more of this information out to everybody. So. Um, okay. So yes. Uh, I'm, I always like to hear good feedback about the about the, the group that we run. It's yeah, it's wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn my screen sharing off, and if I is there a way that I can maximize this uh, this window for myself? Um, uh, well, um, I can uh, to do the questions or. Um, uh, yeah, sure. If any, so if anybody does have any other questions. I'll bring up um, here so we can do those. Yeah. Um, and I'll show too. Also, this is um, the group, the Facebook group that they have here that you can, are welcome to join. Um, I've been, I joined it. Um, lots of good uh, comments and information. It's it's um, lots of people. And as I, some of the questions coming in here, struggling with it, but okay. it's also kind of um, I found looking at what's in there and seeing the posts come up. Um, 
it's it's encouraging because so many people you, know, you said not very many people have received have been able to go through this but there are people posting i got it here's a screenshot of my zero own you know that i owe and so it's really encouraging and you're like oh they did it i can do it it'll happen it's it's not you know it's, and it's some happen. of the some of the for, some of the forgiveness numbers are colossal people who went to dentistry school people who went to med school people who went to law school are reporting that three hundred four hundred thousand dollars oh, yes. has been written off their balance mm -hmm. um huge 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 numbers but even but there's a but there are there are a tremendous number of people who also are receiving forgiveness for um fifty thousand dollars worth of debt forty five thousand dollars of which is interest oh it's ridiculous so yeah. the, you know like the the but that's a whole nother discussion don't get me started <laughs> don't get me started on the federal on the department of education uh loan portfolio it looks like we do have a couple other questions um yes. do you want me to read and, these or do you got it or? yeah are the, and are, the, are these questions by voice or are these questions by text uh in, text. in the question section um okay that i can um do you see them there if you click on questions or if i click on when i click on i have an attendees and i have a chat okay yes i i only see it on my side that's okay i will read them okay. off to you, not a problem yeah. um the first one we have here to the shorter one um it shows that i have I'm assuming in the system there three pslf eligible payments but i've made at least 12 payments on time to nelnet in 2021 how can i address this Okay, so in general, uh, in in general, when you switch to a new servicer, in general, they will pick up the payments, the qualifying payments that you have made to your previous servicer. In general, um, sometimes, but there are there are some situations in which that's not going to be possible. So if you are still with, so it sounds like you have, it sounds like you've already moved to FedLoan. You see that you have three qualifying payments from FedLoan. Mm -hmm. um, what what the Department of Education is doing right now as they apply the waiver to all borrowers' accounts is they're going back through their payment records and they will definitely pick up those 12 payments and by the springtime, mm -hmm. hope probably before the end of April when payments resume, you will see those additional payments in your account. So they're coming, just wait and hope and yeah. Real soon. <laughs> <laughs> Real soon, as they say in government work. <laughs> she says, "Woo, okay." <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, someone else here who says, "It looks like they've gone through all the steps and they're still waiting." Um, she says, "I've gone. Uh, I've done all the steps. Applied for, um, fell for consolidation um, on 10-6, so October. Approved on November 5th. Submitted my PSLF on November 5th, and I've heard nothing from Fed Loans since then." Um, been with a qualified employer for 25 years, still waiting. Okay, is that yes. typical? So that <laughs> uh, it's it's not it's not atypical. Let me put it that way. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes if you some people uh, some people were encouraged to submit employment certification uh, before they submitted before they consolidated their loans, uh, mm -hmm. and those people sometimes seem to have uh, been held up more than other people um, in general it's a good idea to consolidate all your loans together and then submit um, your employment certification especially if you have one set of loans that have 130 140 180 <laughs> a huge number of payments and you have another set of loans that have fewer payments because what happens sometimes is uh your payments will be, you know, your your large number, your your payments that your your loans that you've been paying on for a long time will actually get forgiven before you can consolidate your newer loans in with them. So, um, yeah, so you want to consolidate first, wait for the consolidation to be final, and then submit your employment certification. And again, it can take it can take a long time. Yeah. So that's not yeah. yeah. Um, all right, we have another question here popped in. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Did Matt say the past two COVID years are not in the system yet, um, counting towards the payments? Is that correct? So, um, I did, yeah, I didn't really have a I didn't really have a slide or a description about the COVID forbearance. But in March of 2020, they uh, the Department of Education announced a like uh, 
moratorium on payments in the future. They announced uh, the, what they call this forbearance. Um, there, there are zero, zero dollars is due every single month, right. zero interest is charged. And that month where you pay zero and where you have zero interest, it counts as a qualifying payment. So while it is called forbearance, which is for scary all intents and purposes, that they don't yeah. want that because they want to right. be qualifying. They want the payments to qualify. Yeah. Exactly. So, so for all intents and purposes, during this COVID forbearance, you are in repayment, but your payment has been changed to zero dollars, and your interest rate has been lowered to zero. So, if you have made payments on your direct loans during the period of March 13th, 2020, through the present, you can get those payments refunded to you directly in full from your servicer. So that's a good thing to know. Yeah, you shouldn't. That's yeah, a very good thing to know. To some, people, some people are like, wait a minute, you yeah. mean I can get a refund? And we say yes. Because I'm teaching well, people are thinking, well, I, you know, having the, putting a pause on those you know, loan payments is fine, is nice, but I don't need to, and I'd rather keep working on paying it off. But well, that's actually, that's actually, so the, the whole sort of philosophy of debt is usually about um, making sure that you have, uh, making sure you have the lowest possible interest rate, making sure that you are making extra payments, making sure that you, that you minimize the amount of interest that gets charged. Right. With public service loan forgiveness, that's not the theory that's not how it works best what public service the way public service loan forgiveness works best is when you have a when you have a payment plan a payment amount which is calculated based on your income an income driven repayment number if you make if you make that payment you satisfy the responsibility for having made a payment that month um and once you do that uh, so if you do that, you probably will have interest ballooning on your account, but public service loan forgiveness repay, forgives principal and interest at the end of 120 payments. So people ask all people always ask these questions. They're like, I'm 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 reluctant to consolidate because I have a 1.75% interest rate on my loans now, and I don't want to make I don't want it to go up. Yeah, constantly mm-hmm. saying you know while doing your debt snowball or your debt avalanche or your debt scrum mm-hmm. or however you want to try and like sock away extra payments to chip down on your principal that doesn't make any sense if you're involved in public service loan forgiveness because every dollar that you spend every extra dollar that you spend on your on reducing your loans is just a dollar that will not be forgiven later on mm-hmm. so if you're committed to remaining in public service for the next for up until the end of the 120 payments that you that that are required it does not make any sense to pay any more than you are required to right so you got to so that's think actually about that's actually a really good point. Loans, totally different from your other types of debt that you have yeah, yeah. you can like if you if you want to and especially like if you so like if you have extra money um you know uh Pay down your mortgage debt, pay down your car loan debt, pay down your credit card loan debt. Yeah. Buy something that makes you feel good (laughs) because (laughs) putting it down on your student loan debt is not going to help you at all. Do something Um, else with your money. Yeah. (laughs) And so someone's just clarifying, I think this is what we said. So do the payments of zero dollars during COVID forbearance count as qualifying payments? Yes, Yes, they do. Exactly. Unquestionably, they do. Yes. Yep. So it's kind of sneaky but it's what they did <laughs> it sounds it feels like it's it. not it's not sneaky it's the rules <laughs> i know right but it's it feels like eh, is that really true yes that's what they did yeah i, mean, I was it, telling a story i was telling a story the other day about how like the the sneakiest i ever felt was when i took a home equity loan of credit out on my house that i was living in and i used it to put a down payment on another house <laughs> <laughs> I had to, it was a huge amount of money and I was like oh no they're gonna they're gonna it's it's not gonna be they're gonna they're gonna take it away I know they're gonna take it away but mm-hmm. it was You're just like, it was sure just the rules do this was, that's how it works all right I'll it follow was the rules <laughs> these are the rules um yes after you make 120 qualifying payments your principal and interest 
will be forgiven. And unless you live in Mississippi, um, you won't pay, you'll never pay any federal income tax on it. And unless you live in the state of Mississippi, you won't pay any state tax on it either. Okay. I don't know if we have anybody from Mississippi here today, but <laughs> yeah. Even if we do. <laughs> yeah, if someone watches the recording, no, that's good to know. Okay, so Mississippi has, is to be different than everyone else. Okay. <laughs> goddamn, <laughs> Mississippi, goddamn. <laughs> all right, um, all right. We're a little after eleven o'clock uh, Central Time, so oh. I can stick around if anyone's got if there if anyone has more yeah, questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we, yeah, we don't need to wrap up anything. If, if, that's what I was just gonna say. If anyone still has questions you want to ask of Matt, um, go ahead and type in the question section. We'll stay as long as it takes for you all to get your questions answered, and for anything else he wants to mention. Um, okay, so someone says so. They actually said, "Wow, so I can ask for a refund for the full payments I made during COVID, and I still get credit for those two years as qualified." So basically, you get yep. your money. Yep. So yeah. if you have if you have direct loans, if you have uh, if you have Fell loans or Perkins loans, payments on those loans have continued to be due during the period of March 13th, 2020 to the present. Mm -hmm. So, but any payments that you have made on direct loans, um, those payments are refundable. Direct ones, or if you consolidated into those other ones into the yeah, you loans. you can you can no longer consolidate into fell loans there used to be fell consolidation loans um and like people got tricked they thought that they thought that they had to consolidate and that that was going to help them out but then they discovered that they had consolidated into more fell loans that were still ineligible so it didn't make any difference yeah it didn't, uh, didn't make any difference but during this period of time during this waiver all payments prior to any consolidation will count. So people who were treated, this waiver has been gener has this waiver has been geared towards people who have been treated really, really badly by this program. Yeah. And people who um, had ineligible loans and consolidated them thinking that they were going to become eligible and then found that they that those consolidated loans were not eligible. Those were some people who had really been treated badly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I remember before October of last year when they did make this change, there was all there was repeated news stories and people talking about it online and people I knew talking about it saying over, you know, this program has been in place for a long time, this public loan forgiveness, and only, you know, and 98% of the people who apply are being denied. It's completely broken. It's yep. not working. And is anybody going to do anything about this? You know, what's the point? And people were so discouraged and saying, "What's the point? This whole program is 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 a disaster." And I hope someone and someone did do something about it. Yes, they did finally. Yeah. So and hopefully people hear about that. The people who you know who were so discouraged in the past didn't just give up. And so I hope you're here if that was your case or someone will see this or see all the all the all the different other presentations and things that you've done um, yeah i don't want to get i don't want to get political because the department of education's loan portfolio has been managed poorly um during republican and democratic administrations going back oh, uh, yeah. going back a long time um but during the previous administration the depart the secretary of education was particularly unwilling to she actually did the, the previous administration did actually make a bunch of process improvements to the to to the public service loan forgiveness so but her but she was very but her, the betsy was very unsympathetic towards any people who were looking for loan forgiveness of any time of any kind um but yes so someone did someone did do something to make changes to the there there are there's legislation that defines um the way the public service loan forgiveness can work so mm -hmm. there and then there's there are there are rules that the department of education interprets um mm -hmm. so the changes that have been made have been largely rule changes um and there's an ongoing process of negotiated rule changing new rule making which has been very enthusiastic about which which look at which is looking very positive but those changes probably will not go into uh will not go into effect until september of 2023 mm -hmm. there are various different things that may be yeah. included right. in those new rules but we don't really know yeah yeah um someone who has two questions this is from laura um 
she said, I just consolidated my loans because I had Perkins loans. Uh, the rest of my loans are direct. Uh, the rep said I can either consolidate the Perkin loan with one of those direct loans or consolidate all of them together. She said from a credit standpoint, it might help if I consolidated all of them so I only had one loan listed versus 21 on my credit. So I consolidated all of them. Um, but I know with the direct loans, it won't make a difference for the count, but is it okay that I did that? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> um, and then she says also, I got a, a second question. I got a letter from Fed Loan after I consolidated wanting to confirm that I intentionally included direct loans. Is that normal? Is that okay? That is, so Fed Loans operates independently of the Department of Education and Fed Loan has not, Fed Loan maintains that they have not been given enough specific direction about how loan forgiveness is going about how about how these changes are affecting their workflow so many people when they consolidate they get a scary letter from fed loan that says that's that raises their alarm and indicates to them that their payment count will go down to zero and that they will have to restart building 120 payments but that is temporary so when so like right now right now because it's not their rules or their operating procedure fed loan cannot add qualifying payments to consolidated loans but in the spring real soon as they as i've been saying a lot real soon the department of education will review every single borrower's account and every single payment that has ever been made and they will go back add qualifying payments so if you so consolidate like now it's like an automated letter from fed loan just because of what you did that without exactly it's no. an automated letter from fed loan and it's the same automated letter well they might have they might have made a little bit of changes to it but it's pretty much the same automated letter that you would have gotten from them if you had consolidated five years ago before or any of these changes went in you yeah consolidated before the waiver came in okay Great. So it's all a waiting game at the moment. More good good stuff is coming in the next few months, hopefully. <laughs> um, hopefully. Spring, yeah, coming. Uh, it depends on when you think of spring coming, too. I know we had, the, it was the meteorological first day of spring, and then the spring begins. And here in Nebraska today, the high is going to be 77. I don't know what's going on in the world, but. <laughs> Thank you, fossil fuels. <laughs> yes. Thanks, climate change. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, oh, got another question that just came in. Awesome. Um, the income-based payment plans consider my spouse's income, and as a result, the monthly payment is quite high. Hmm. Aside from filing separately, uh, do you have any suggestions? Um, in reading some of the income repayment plans, some of them say they will forgive a balance after 20 years of payment. Is that different from the PSLF 120 payments? Okay, so we got two questions here. Right. Um, so let me start with the second question. Um, there are other loan forgiveness programs out there. Um, people yeah. often ask in our group about borrower defense. People often, ask, which is a, a different a different program for student loan discharge. People often ask about. Um, teacher loan forgiveness, which is a different program from public service loan forgiveness. People often ask about, and people often ask about this program that you're talking about, which the government refers to as IDR forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, so any income-driven repayment plan, well, each income-driven repayment plan has a provision in it that if you pay your same income-based repayment number your same income driven your same income contingent repayment plan number your same pay as you earn number your same revised pay as you earn number for a period of time whether that's 15 years or 20 years or 25 years mm -hmm. they have this clause in the income driven repayments that allows for forgiveness of the complete uh, for forgiveness of the whole balance of that loan at the mm -hmm. end of that period of time now that's an unproven um, system, and the balances that you the balances that are forgiven under that program um, 
have historically been taxable, although there was a there was a loophole carved out that for the next five years they will not be taxable. But if you think that if you thought that the level of um, acceptance for public service loan forgiveness was accept was unacceptable two years ago, the acceptance rate for income driven repayment um, is even lower. Mm -hmm. It's um, so uh, so that is an option, but it's under almost all circumstances, it, it's not a good option. And in almost all circumstances, coming looking for public service loan forgiveness is a better uh, is a better option. So back to the first question: um, income driven repayment plans do. Uh, so one of the income driven so income driven income driven repayment plans sometimes take in spousal income. Income driven repayment plans are not always the lowest payment plan that is available hmm. oftentimes depending on their financial situation um people find that couples find that if they file jointly the payment their student loan payment is really high yeah and the strategy that they use is to file is to do married filing separately and mm -hmm. reduce the income of the borrowing spouse with things like taking child care deductions with things like taking um, IRA deductions with things like taking um, all pre-tax all pre-tax deductions so basically they increase the uh, the the um, the reported AGI of one partner and decrease the reported AGI of the other mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not there's nothing there's nothing illegal about that it's just but what but what happens is that as a result of having the lower AGI the sp the borrower spouse has a much lower payment and okay. the idea is that the the lowering payment um overbalances the tax consequences of filing married filing separately so right married filing married to so the strategy of married filing separately um does work for lots and lots and lots of people um i think that was the answer i think that's the answer to the yeah. question do you want to, yeah, they asking about filing separately to make it so that the payments are not as high. Yep. Yeah, if you're going to do that, you really want to make sure that you run your taxes both ways, whether you have an accountant do it or whether you do it on your own, whether you use a mm -hmm. TurboTax or uh, whatever, whether you whether you use a whatever, whether you use a software product or whether you just do it by hand. Right. You'll you'll Check learn for yourself. Um, no one can no one can advise you about what your financial situation is, what's going to be best for you. But in general, married filing separately, reducing the income of the spouse who's paying back loans tends to be a successful strategy for a lot of people. Yeah, but test it out first and you yeah. can do the math to see if it does. Your yeah. mileage may vary, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, we have another question that came in. Um, is it a good idea to ask for an internal forbearance with Fed loans to avoid paying starting in May 2022, especially since I'm way over 120 payments and waiting for forgiveness? Yes, it is. So about? when you fill in your employment certification form slash temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness application slash public service loan forgiveness application, your single form, there is a checkbox on it that says, it basically, the, there are two checkboxes. One is, I just want to know how many payments I have made and I want to continue on in repayment. And the other box is, I believe I have made 120 payments. And when you click on that box, you will enter forbearance and you will not have to pay after April 1st, 2022, because you'll be in forbearance. And what you're basically saying is, I'm just waiting for Fed Loan and the Department of Education to recognize that I have made 147 payments. Um, and and that kind I don't. Of, kind of frustrating. I can see that this is all coming up at the same time, too. In the spring, Department of Education will, go, will be going back and find all those old payments. But also in spring, May, the payments are going to start up again. So hopefully, <laughs> the Department of Education. Yeah, the, I, the, I think I think the hope is that the extra payments will be added before the before payments restart. So yeah. the answer to your question is: if you believe you have made more than 120 payments, then yes, absolutely, do request forbearance because you while 
yeah, while at, while payments over 120 on direct loans are refundable, mm -hmm. it's um, one less thing to have to do later. Yeah, you know, like yeah. why pay? You know, why pay $1,200 now to get it back in five months? Right. When you know that 120 payment thing that you did is gonna take yeah. care of it anyways. You just gotta wait for the wait for the different um you know federal departments to catch up with each other kind of. <laughs> And she says, thank you both, with big all caps, absolutely. <laughs> all right, that was the last question we had. Um, does anybody have anything desperate that you want to ask right now of Matt before we wrap things up? Um, go ahead and type it into the question section. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier, well, I did mention in the beginning, we are recording, so if you did have to take off or didn't get, you know, stay here, I know I did see some people did leave as it hit, some people it's a lot, an hour to watch, and that's fine. Um, everything's being recorded, so any questions we have here will be in the um, archive recording. Um, so I'll keep an eye on the questions and show you over here um, where our recordings come here is our main Encompass Live website. If you Google and or use your search engine of choice to look up Encompass Live, we're the only thing called that on the internet. No one else is allowed to use that name because <laughs> you will come up with just us. There's no Encompass Insurance? Not that I know. We got to do Encompass Live. Okay. The whole thing. <laughs> That's it. I don't know about anything else. <laughs> There's um, every insurance company. There could be, yeah. Um, we have comments coming in saying thank you so much for all the great info. Um, but these are upcoming shows, but right underneath them is the link to our archives. Most recent one will come as at the top of the page here. So this is last week's show. Today's will be here um, by the end of the day tomorrow. I should have all the recording ready and posted up here. Everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that it's ready for you to watch. Um, while we're here, I'll also show you there's a search feature for our archives. You want to look for any other topics you might be interested in. You can search our full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want to jump something just current. Um, and that is because, get back over here, um, this is our full show archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way down to the bottom because you can see this is a huge page. Um, this is going back to when Encompass Live premiered, which was in January 2009. So we're in our 13th year of the show and all of our shows are here. <laughs> Um, this is something we do. We're librarians. We re we archive things. We keep things for historical purposes. And as long as we have a place to keep them all, um, they will be here. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date when you do watch any of the older shows. Uh, lots of the information will still be good and stand the test of time. But many things, some things will become outdated. Information may be wrong. Um, links may be broken. Resources and services may have changed drastically or no longer exist anymore. But like I said, we will always keep them up here for historical purposes. But just pay attention to that date if you do watch any of our shows. So I didn't see any other questions come in now while I was chat talking. That's, that's good. I think we've answered everyone's questions for now. Um, everyone you know thank you everyone for being here today you can always go I definitely highly recommend go and join the group on um facebook or the reddit to get in from, you know help for matt's on there too and he posted here i think it was uh she was posting things here but there wasn't he did post about uh attending today's show, <laughs> webinar somewhere down in there um that the recording we pushed out to this group as well um, so um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for coming and telling us about all of this. I know, as I said, people have been struggling and it's been painful and it's awesome that we finally have a way to make this work and it's working. <laughs> yep, it does, it does continue to get, I don't think that there has ever been a change that they have made to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program that which has not made it better and easier. Um, and this particular set of changes not only makes it better and easier, but it makes it simpler. Mm -hmm. um, Which is so what we need from the federal it government. Really, it really is, you know, there are three There are three categories. And again, if you do not believe that you fit into one of those three categories, just read those three categories again. Think about and, it, probably do, yeah. And take a breath, <laughs> take a breath, in the breath out. And it's okay. Ask yourself what it is that you need to do next. And again, if we're, if you, and, and if, <laughs> and w there is help out there. Yes, there is help. There is Matt, there's other people, um, other people who have gone through this, um, have give good advice as well on there. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much. Um, for Encompass Live, we also do have a Facebook page for our show. Um, we post reminders as a reminder to log in today's show, um, reminders about other events going on. We had our 
uh, when our recordings are available. So if you do like to use Facebook, um, give us a like over there. We also post onto Twitter and Instagram using our hashtag NCompLive. So you can look there for that. Um, so that'll wrap it up for today. Um, I hope uh, these are our upcoming shows. Um, next week, we are ta we'll be talking about the importance of chit chat to your small library. Um, Shelly O'Brien is from Neckles, which is the Northeast Kansas library system just south of us. And she's going to come and talk about um, these informal conversations and how you can help them out um, in, in this even into the smallest library. So please register for that show and any of our other upcoming topics we have coming up on Encompass Live. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Matt. Good to see you. And everybody, good luck with your loans. Go and get them all forgiven. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.